Hi, this is Dane Quinn from the University of Akron. Welcome to my video lectures for engineering mechanics. And in particular today, we're going to talk about constraints between coordinates. So whenever we have a you know, relatively complicated mechanical system, it's often a good idea to define several different coordinates. And really today, we'll do an example that focuses on how we relate those coordinates within this context. So here we have it, uh, disk, mass m, radius r, rolls on a horizontal surface. Now, that disk is connected to the ground through a cable wrapped around its outer surface, right, and a spring with spring constant k1. And then we have an inner hub on this disk. You think about it like a spool, maybe. And around that inner hub is another cable that is connected to ground with a spring of stiffness K2. Finally, we have viscous damping, linear damping, with damping coefficient B that's connected to the center. So if the system rolls without slip, I'd like to find the resulting equations of motion for this system. So a couple of things. We'll always start off and we'll think about the problem, right? We'll think about the motion, the degree of freedom, we'll identify some forces. Then we'll define coordinates and directions. We'll use those to talk about the kinematics and in particular for this problem we'll focus on the constraints between the different coordinates that we'll use. Then we actually write the forces in terms of our free body diagram, equations of motion, and off we go. So starting off with how this disk moves. Well, it rotates, right? it's free to roll, and translates. So again, here rotation is rotational motion of the disk, which it certainly does as it rolls along. And then the fact that the mass center moves implies that there is some translational component to that motion as well. Now, there's a no-slip condition due to the friction at the, the surface, right, the contact point here, which means that the rotation and translation are related. And this is a one degree of freedom system. We only need one coordinate to specify where this disk is. It could be the rotation angle that it goes through. It could be the position of the center of the disk. But whatever it is, right, we can use that one coordinate to determine where everything is about this system. Now, I will notice that each spring and damper undergoes a different displacement. Right, so the displacement of that upper spring is different than the displacement of the lower spring. And that's different again than the displacement of the damper or the center of the, the disk. So that's really where our multiple coordinates are going to come into. And that's what's going to give rise to these constraint equations between the different coordinates. So now let's go and think about the forces that act on this system. Here, um, you know, we have gravity. So we'll say that's Fg. We have a normal force. We have a normal force that acts at the contact point. We have a friction force that acts also at the contact point. I will point out that there's no slip. So the friction force is not equal to mu times n. It's just whatever it needs to be to maintain this no slip condition. And then finally, we have a force from the upper spring. We'll say that's F1. We have a force from the lower spring. Maybe that's F2. And then we have a force due to the damping, Fd. So again, F1 and F2 arise from the springs. Fd is from the damper. Fg is due to the weight. 
force due to gravity, the normal and the friction force are essentially contact forces at the reaction point or at the contact point between the disk and the ground. Both of these have unknown magnitude, but we're going to assume that the normal force is perpendicular to the surface, friction force is along the surface. We actually know the weight, minus mg in the j direction, and then we can relate the spring and damping forces to the resulting coordinates that we'll use. Speaking of coordinates, now's a good time to, to define them. Looking at the directions involved, everything is going to be in the i and j direction. Now, let's go and measure the different coordinates. Start off with the motion. So here, we want to measure the rotation of this disk, right? Because we know it rotates. And we'll do that with some angle theta. We also know that the center of the disk moves left and right. So let's go and define a coordinate x, which measures the displacement of the center of the disk. So in terms of the motion, there's x and there's theta, and of course those are related. Now let's go and look at the various spring and damping forces. The damper, its force depends on the velocity across the damper, and we can actually use x for the damping force, but the displacement of these two springs is not necessarily equal to x. Right? There's, there's some other measurement that needs to be made. So in particular, let's put a point, and we'll call this B, on the upper spring, and we'll measure the stretch in that spring with Z. Also, let's go and define G as the mass center, and then this point C is the contact point. Then, let's identify the stretch in the lower spring with a coordinate y. Again, x, y, and z are related, but not equal to one another. y is the stretch in the lower spring, z is the stretch in the upper spring, and x is the displacement of the center of the disk. So now, in terms of the kinematics, we need to relate these coordinates. We have our no-slip condition, right? So that no-slip condition implies that the velocity of point C is equal to zero. Right? Because there's, a, if there's no slip. There's no relative motion between this point C on the disk and the point C on the ground. Of course, since the ground has zero velocity, that means that the point of contact has zero velocity. So now we can develop constraint equations using actually the velocity. All right, so we'll, we'll take these constraint equations and we'll base them on velocities. I find that this is the easiest way of identifying constraints between coordinates, is to really look at the velocities of different points on this object and then relate those velocities and the velocity equations back to the coordinates that we've defined. So let's take the, the, the most common example, right? So how can we relate x, the center of the disk, and theta, the rotation of the disk? You may, you may know this answer, right? And you may be able to look at this and go, oh, well, x is minus r times theta. And that would be true. But I'd like to develop that based on the velocities so that then we can use those ideas to go through and figure out z, and also y through this point A that is attached to the other side of spring 2. So how do we use the velocities? Well, the velocity of g 
is the velocity of C plus the angular velocity of the disk cross the position of G with respect to C. This is one of these velocity kinematic equations that we learned about in dynamics. So if we want to relate the velocity of two points on a rigid body, say V and G, obviously this disk is rigid, right? C is a point on the disk, G is a point on the disk, and so their velocities are related through this relationship. Well, now we're just going to fill in what we know. The velocity of G, well, that's measured in terms of X, right? So X dot in the I direction is the velocity of G. What's the velocity of C? Well, that's zero because we have this no-slip condition. Angular velocity of the disk? Well, that's theta dot in the k direction. And then the position of G with respect to C, so that would be the vector from C up to G, is R in the j direction. So when I work out this cross product, k cross j is minus R theta dot in the i direction. So the coefficient of the i components has, they have to match. x dot is equal to minus r theta dot, or effectively integrated in time, right? So x dot is equal to minus r theta dot. If I integrate both sides with respect to time, well, the integral of a derivative is just whatever's inside. And so we see that x is equal to minus r theta. And this is the coordinate relationship that we assumed we had. Right? Um, maybe you remember this from, from dynamics or, or even from physics. Um, this is my rolling constraint. One important assumption here that, that often gets overlooked is the fact that this requires that both x and theta vanish at the same time, right? So there's a common configuration that we're measuring all of these coordinates from. And that's okay. Let's assume that all the coordinates are measured from, say, the static equilibrium position, right? So if this thing is in static equilibrium, right, then all of these coordinates are equal to zero. Let's use this same process to relate maybe z and theta. So here, the velocity of B is the velocity of C plus the angular velocity of the disk cross R of now B with respect to C. So that becomes Z dot in the I direction, zero plus theta dot K cross now this new position vector from C all the way up to, well, I'll say the top of the disk, because every point on this cable has the same velocity, right? So the velocity of this point is the same as the velocity of that point all the way over to the top of the disk. So that's going to be 2r in the j direction, which, of course, is equal to k cross j minus i minus 2r theta dot in the i direction. Or, again, same thing we did here, z is equal to minus 2r times theta. Finally, velocity of a, you know what to do now, right? Omega cross r, a with respect to c, velocity of a, y dot in the i direction. Angular velocity is still the same thing, and now this position vector, well, this hub is half the radius, so it's r over 2 in the j direction. And that becomes minus r theta dot over 2 in the i direction. Or y is equal to minus r theta over 2. So here are our constraint equations. We have one between x and theta. We have one between z and theta. And then we have one between y and theta. We can use these actually to relate any two coordinates. So for example, if you wanted to relate x and y, well, you could solve this for theta. And then you could put that in here. 
and you would find that y is equal to x over 2. The last part of our kinematic calculation is basically just identifying the acceleration of the disk. Right? So that's linear and angular acceleration of the disk. Right, so the linear acceleration is going to be a, the acceleration of g, which we'll use x, right, because x measures the position of g. So that's x double dot in the i direction. And the angular acceleration of the disk is theta double dot in the k direction. So we've identified a bunch of different coordinates, right, and we've used those coordinates to define the linear and angular accelerations. And we have also identified the constraint equations between these different coordinates that we are making use of. OK, so now, free body diagram. Identify the forces. And we want to identify forces in terms of the coordinates and directions that we defined earlier. And we chose the coordinates so that it would make this step easy. Looking at the force in spring one, right? Z is the stretch in spring one. So this force minus K1 times Z in the I direction. Again, I'm not worried about how z is related to x and y and theta and all these other things at this point. I'm just trying to figure out how do we define this force. I've already gotten the constraint equations, and I'll use that later. But for right now, I want to keep this as simple as possible. For the force in the damper, well, x is the easiest coordinate to use. So let's use it. Minus b, x dot in the i direction. This lower spring, minus k2, y, in the i direction. Then we have these other three forces. The weight is minus mg in the j direction. The normal force, I have no idea what the magnitude is. I could probably figure it out, but that would require me actually solving the equations of motion ahead of time, which I don't want to do. It will actually fall out that the normal force is equal to the weight when we apply the equations of motion. But for now, let's not assume that we know more than we do. Finally, this friction force. I have no idea what it is, because again, this rolls without slip. So I know it's less than mu times n, but I don't know how much less. I don't know what the value is. I do know it's in the i direction. So here are our forces. And now we apply momentum balance. We'll apply linear momentum balance on the disk and angular momentum, angular momentum balance and we'll do this about a specific point and that point is the contact point. There really are three points that we can apply angular momentum balance about. One of them is the mass center. Right? We can always apply the angular momentum balance about the mass center of the object. And that always works. If this object were pinned in the ground, which it's not, but if it were, we could apply angular momentum balance about that point. Or, in this case, because we have a disk that rolls without slip on the ground, we can apply angular momentum balance about the contact point. And the advantage here is that angular momentum balance about point C eliminates both the unknown normal force and the unknown friction force. So here, sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. Well, start copying stuff down minus K1Z. That's a force. Minus B X dot in the I direction. 
That's a force. Minus K2Y in the I direction. Minus MGJ. N, J, and the friction force in the I direction equals M, X, double dot in the I direction. So here we can go and now collect terms in the different directions. In the I direction, we have minus K1 times Z, B, X dot, minus K2 times Y, and the friction force, FR, all in the I direction. In the J direction, we have minus MG plus N, and that's going to be equal to MX double dot in the I direction. So again, these I components must match up. And then this J component, well, there's a zero in the J direction over here on the right. So N would be equal to mg. Angular momentum balance, right? So some of the moments about point C is the moment of inertia about point C times the angular acceleration. And I'll remind you that if you want to calculate a moment, it's R, it's the position of P. Let's say the force is applied at point P. Position of where the force is applied with respect to C, cross the force itself. And then finally, I'll also remind you that the moment of inertia of an object using the parallel axis theorem is the moment of inertia about the mass center plus the total mass times the distance between the mass center and this point squared. Right? So here, this is the vector from C to G. We could do it the other way around, and I take the magnitude squared. So looking at these moments, let's calculate them. Here, the moment due to the normal force vanishes, right, because it acts at the contact point. The moment due to the friction force vanishes because it acts at the contact point. So this R is zero. The moment due to gravity vanishes, right, because R and F are parallel, right? So this position vector is in the same direction as the force itself. We have no moment. So we only have moments from the two springs and the damping force. So let's go and calculate those. Well, let's look at the force in spring one first. So this moment from the contact point all the way up to the point of application is 2R in the J direction cross the force itself minus K1Z in the I direction. So that's the moment produced by this force. Now looking at the damping force, I have R in the J direction cross minus B X dot in the I direction. And then finally, the second spring, we have R over 2 J cross minus K 2 Y I. And this is going to be equal to the moment of inertia. So for a disk, its moment of inertia is through M R squared over 2 about the center plus now M and the distance between C and G is R squared. Angular acceleration, we said, was theta double dot in the K direction. So now we'll go through and work all these cross products out. J cross I is minus K. And, and I'll remind you of, of, of the way that I do this. Right? So if I have I, J, K, I usually write I, J, K, and I'll, I'll start over again. And if I cross this way, right, so I cross J is equal to K, J cross K is equal to I, K cross I is equal to J, it's positive. And then if I cross going the other way, it's negative, right? So in this case, J cross I is minus K. And so we already have a minus sign, and that gives me 2 K1 times R times Z.
for this second piece, I have b times r times x dot. Again, j cross i is minus k. And then finally, I have k2 r over 2 times y. And those are all in the k direction. And then this becomes 3m r squared over 2 theta double dot in the k direction. So here I have actually three equations. I've got angular momentum balance, right, which ends up being in the k direction. And then I actually have this equation from linear momentum balance in the i direction. And finally, I have an equation in the j direction. And of course, this is 0. So we get three scalar equations from momentum balance. I've written them again here. Linear momentum balance in the i direction, linear momentum balance in the j direction, and angular momentum balance. Now, I've also given you those three constraint equations that we also developed earlier. Because, let's count how many unknowns we have. Well, six. We don't know x. x was the displacement of the center of the disk. I don't know y, the displacement of the lower spring, or z, or theta. I also don't know what the normal load is. And I don't know what the friction force is. So I've got these six unknowns in this system of equations. Fortunately, I have one, two, three, four, five, six equations. So, we can solve. More than that, I'll point out that n only appears in this equation. Right, so I can solve for n directly. n is equal to mg. Again, we promised that, that we would find that as part of our solution procedure. We don't have to assume anything about the normal load. I will also notice that the friction force only appears in this equation. Now, x and y and z also appear in this equation, right? But if I could go ahead and solve for x and y and z, at the end of all this, I could go back and solve for the friction force, right? Essentially, these two equations decouple from the remaining four. So I only have to deal with these four equations. And, and these are actually nice. Because all of these constraint equations, I can use them directly and then introduce that back into the equation from angular momentum balance. Right? So we can reduce this to a single equation on any coordinate that we choose. Uh, let's choose x. So we'll reduce this to a single equation in terms of x. Well, in order to do that, I need to write y and z and theta in terms of x. Okay, that's not so bad. Right here, we recognize that we can solve this for theta. All right, so here theta is equal to minus x over r. All right. I can use that to find z. z here is actually equal to 2x. Alternatively, notice that I have minus r theta is equal to x. And so this is really just 2 times minus r theta. So it's 2x. Likewise, y is x over 2. OK, so great. I have these coordinates all written in terms of x. I have angular momentum balance. And so I'll take this, substitute it in, and we end up with the following equation of motion. 4 k1 times r x plus b times r times x dot. Okay, that was direct. And then k2 r over 4 times x is equal to minus 3m r over 2 times 
x double dot, okay, when we eliminate theta there. So, we'll actually cancel out all of these r's, and we end up with the following equation of motion. 3m over 2 x double dot plus b times x dot, and then 4k1 and k2 over 4 times x is equal to 0. Notice that even though we have two springs, they don't kind of contribute equally. k1 is actually 4k1 in this sort of stiffness coefficient. k2 actually becomes k2 over 4 in this stiffness coefficient. Right, so, you know, for equal values of k1 and k2, this upper spring would contribute four times, well, actually 16 times, as much as this lower spring. So, noting that, we can identify the response parameters. And so that's the natural frequency. Omega n is the square root of, well, whatever this piece is, 4, k1, k2 over 4, divided by whatever this coefficient in front of the x double dot term is, 3m over 2. So actually, I can, I can, I can simplify that to 16, k1, plus k2, divided by 6m, right? So this is the natural frequency in terms of these various system parameters. We can do the same for the damping ratio. Damping ratio is zeta, and that's going to be b, right, because that's the coefficient of x dot, 2 square root, well, stiffness, 4k1, k2 over 4, times coefficient of x double dot, which is 3m over 2. Again, I can simplify this to square root of 2 times b. So I've basically just done some algebra here. And then in the denominator, we get 16k1 plus k2 times 6m. So the natural frequency and damping ratio can all be identified in terms of the various parameters of the system. Now, last thing. Let's do this again. Except now let's use theta for our coordinate. Once again, I've, I've reproduced the equations and I've actually gone through and solved for this equation in terms of theta. So I took x, substituted in there. This was substituted in for zero, z, and so forth for y. So here's the resulting equation of motion. Like I said, just a little bit of algebra, you can do this yourself. Now, when I go to calculate the response parameters, what do we get? Well, we get the natural frequency. is the square root of, you know, what's here in front of theta and what's divided by what's here in front of theta double dot. And notice that these are different than what we had before. So we get for k1 r squared, k2 r squared over 4, all divided by 3m r squared over 2. Okay, that's different, but we can go and simplify this. And when we simplify it, we get 16 k1 plus k2 divided by 6m. Like I said, just do a little algebra here. This is what you get. Well, what I want to point out is that that's exactly the same thing that we got before. 
So even though the equation of motion looks different, right, these coefficients, if you were to calculate the, the numerical values here, right, this number would be different than that number. And so the resulting equations would look different. But when you calculate the natural frequency, you would get exactly the same thing. Well, the same holds true for the damping ratio. When I calculate the damping ratio, I get zeta is br squared divided by 2, and then all of this stuff. And then 3m r squared over 2. So here's the damping ratio. It doesn't take the same form, but when I reduce this, I end up with square root of 2 times b divided by 16k1 plus k2 times 6m, which, as promised, is exactly the same thing that I got before. So uh, the important sort of statement from here is that the equations of motion and in particular exactly what they look like, they may differ based on the coordinates that you choose. They would be even more different if we were to choose, say, z and y. However, the response parameters and that's the natural frequency and damping ratio in this case. These are properties of the system. And you'll get exactly the same thing regardless of how you choose to model this. So if you choose to develop equations of motion in terms of y right, or z or some other coordinate that might be convenient for you to use, you'll get exactly the same natural frequency and damping ratio even though the equations of motion that you find might look different. So, uh, again, this is an important point because it means that there are really fundamental things that are characteristics of the system and don't depend on how you choose or I choose to measure the response of that system. However, the equations, they do depend on your coordinates, right? Because they are predicting what I'm measuring. If you use different coordinates, right, you're going to measure a different thing. So the equations will depend, in general, on the coordinates that you choose. So that's it for today. Uh, again, this is an example really dealing with constraints and, and how different coordinates are related. Um, and it's also a nice example of, of rolling contact. So that's it for today. Thanks so much. Um, of course, if you ever have any questions, right, please feel free to reach out. You can leave a comment on the video. You can email me. You can call me. Um, I'm fairly accessible. Uh, and, and again, if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to, to ask. Reach out. Let me know. Love to hear any feedback that you have. Thanks so much, and I will probably talk to you again. Bye.